I was in the ninth grade, freshman year, and uh, maybe had a little more confidence uh, than um, I should have. And uh, there was this young lady, she was a junior, and man, I liked her, okay? I was, I was smitten, as your parents would say. And, um, and, and so I uh, had some intel. Ever get bad intel before? Ever get bad information from your friends? Okay, we went to the same high school, we were in the same youth group, and I was being encouraged, hey, this girl likes you. And I'm like, you know, I know I'm a freshman, but like I still have some swag, you know what I mean? And like, I know it's gonna take a lot for her to walk around school hand in hand with a freshman and she's a junior, but like, I'm just, if they get a glimpse of me, you know what I mean? And so I just, I got up the nerve after a while to ask her to homecoming. And I'm just like, surely she's not gonna go alone. Well, I've, we've been catching eyes and chit chatting and all the different things. And I had the intel to ask her to homecoming. And I felt like it was a sure yes. Anybody been there before? The sure yes, except it was a quick no. No, look, she regrets that even today. I know she does. Okay, I promise. I promise. Okay. And uh, however, I, I was a little bit deceived. I, 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 I believed something that wasn't necessarily true. Anybody been there? I mean, I really believed that she liked me and that she was going to go to homecoming. And then when push came to shove, she didn't. I was deceived. And here's the deal. Half-truths will get you in trouble. So what we tell ourselves sometimes gets us in trouble. When it's not the full truth and the whole truth and we just give ourselves something that makes us feel better, when push comes to shove, ouch, we end up hurting ourselves. And did you know that, that the spirit of, of deceit, of self-deception, okay? Now, in this scenario, of course, I was taking my shot. I missed. I'm back, okay? But in this situation, okay, maybe, maybe I'm using that as an example, but there are other areas in our life where we are self-deceived and it leads us to trouble. And so today, I want to talk to you and I want to teach you how to break that spirit, Break that spirit of self-deception, and if you do, the unlimited potential for your life can be unlocked. Okay, so look at somebody way across the room and tell them, break that spirit. If you're in the chats, type it. If you know somebody who's self-deceived, share this service with them. Just don't tell them why. Amen. All right, self-deception. Let's break that spirit. That's the title of my message today. Obviously, all of us, we have baggage. Spiritual attacks in our lives that rear its nasty head into our relationships, decision-making, it affects our peace. I think you'd agree with that. Okay. However, we have the power to break that spirit that deceives us, that keeps us from victory. Victory is yours in Jesus' name. Do you believe that? And you can have victory over all sorts of things in your life, generational iniquity, stuff that your parents did, stuff that you did that you didn't mean to or didn't want to. You came into Christ, God set you free, but you got some stuff still in your bones that you need victory over. God wants to and can and does give you victory over those things. And the same goes with what you believe, self-deception. So I want to take us to a story in the scriptures that is all about self-deception, and it's a tough story. I'm just telling you right now, th this is a tough one today. You want to get your notebooks out. You want to take a good swallow because you're going to feel that lump in your chest. I'm just telling you, it's one of those stories. But aren't you grateful for the conviction of God that leads us to victory, leads us into all truth? Okay. All right, so, so that's where we're going to go today. Acts chapter 5. This is the first time the ecclesia, the word church, is used in the New Testament. This idea of a gathered people. Acts chapter 5, verse 1, now a man named Ananias, not the same Ananias that leads and disciples Saul to Paul, but this is a different one, Ananias with his wife Sapphira, and they sold a piece of property. And with his wife's full knowledge and complicity, he kept back some of the proceeds, bringing only a portion of it. Let's say that together, only a portion, only a portion and set it at the apostles' feet. Set it at the apostles' feet. Now, little context here. The early church was growing rapidly. 
So much to the point where they were such a movement. I mean, they were expanding wildly. And because of the difficulty of the time that they were in, they would share basically everything with one another. You would bring your wealth. You would bring your dollars. You'd lay it at the disciples. They might distribute it. I mean, they were being fed. They were feeding others. They were poor. They were being arrested. They were being killed. So the, the, the challenge of the moment, uh, the persecution of the moment was driving them to be close together, to trust each other. I think there might come a day where in even the American church or the Western church that things get so difficult, it's going to drive us to be together and we're going to stop caring about white, black, green, orange, and red. Did you hear me? We're going to be so desperate for Jesus that we're going to stop obsessing over our differences, start acknowledging and celebrating our culture and our uniqueness, and come together as one. So in this moment, they are really being driven. And so what would happen, according to chapter 4, verse 34, uh, some, not all, would sell pieces of property. And when they would, they would lay the entire proceeds at the disciples' feet to do with what they thought. I just want to say, if God leads you to sell a property or a large item, please come lay it at my feet. I will tattoo your name in my arm. Amen. We'll name the little section of the building after you. Okay. Just kidding. In, verse, in chapter 4, there's an individual named Barnabas uh, who does exactly this. Now, I want you to pay attention, okay? There may have been implications that Ananias and Sapphira had vowed to give the entire proceeds of the sale to God, but then changed their mind last minute. This is the rub. When we say only gave a portion of it, Okay, it reminds me that sometimes we'll be in a service, sometimes we'll be under preaching, sometimes we'll be in our devotions, and we'll hear something from God, and God leads us, and we're like, okay, God, you can have all of me. I will be obedient. I will break up with this person, or I will take this step. All of these different areas, but then when push comes to solve, and it's the moment, we say, God, you can only have part of it, only a portion of it. Well, what is that? Well, then we lie. That becomes religion, not spirituality. God might be saying, hey, I, I, and what we've done is we've said, okay, I'll, I'll break up with them, but I won't stop hooking up with them. You understand? Like, like half obedience, half truth, it's self-deception. Thinking that we're going to get a portion of God's favor or a, or, or a portion of God's best, but then only give a portion of ourself. Are you following me? Look at this phrase, part of the proceeds. They sold the possession and gave only a portion, implying implying that they sacrificially gave when they didn't sacrificially gave, they religiously gave. Now, now, if we're not careful, we might think that this whole sermon is about paying your tithes. And God bless you, do that. But that's not what this sermon is about. It's about the heart. It's about being deceived. The same word, okay, kept back in the Greek is to misappropriate. Stay with me. You see that same word in Joshua 7, verse 21, and you see it in the New Testament in Titus chapter 2. Ultimately, listen, ultimately, they stole not only from the people of God, they stole from God, but they also stole from themselves. Hear me, when you are self-deceived, you're not just stealing from your potential in the earth for other people, but you're stealing and limiting the potential for yourself. Because God can only do with you if you surrender all of you. And both the husband and the wife were partners in this deception. They wanted the image of generosity without actually being generous. Stay with me. They wanted the image of generosity without actually being generous. How many of us want the image of spirituality? We're in church. It's good. Some of us really like this mask thing way too much. Because like you already were wearing a mask and like this allows you to be extra good at hiding. So you're crying, you're biting your cheeks, you're in church and you're like, God, you can have part of me, but nobody can see. See, a lot of us, it's natural. It's our human nature to only offer a portion, only offer half of ourselves. It's, it, it's, it's in our human nature to give off an image, an idea of spirituality, but actually just be religious. 
I'll give you some examples. We do this as humans, right? Ladies, I love you. Don't be mad at me. I don't get my own emails anyway, so you can't send me one. I'll take a selfie with a scripture in it, in the copy, but my cleavage is hanging out. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, what? You like got Proverbs 31 and you're like, you know, I don't know, whatever. It's like, I am the woman that they waited on, right? Obviously. And then it's just like, wow. Oh, I can't even read the scripture. You know, or like you got the beach pose or whatever that is, you know, don't make me do it. You know, whatever. And it's like, it's like, and it's like, it's like, holy, holy is our God almighty. <laughs> holy, holy is what? Holy, holy is your genes almighty. Right. And like, oh no, like you can't like, that's, 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 that's giving the image. I'm saying I'm, 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 sp I'm writing a scripture but I'm redirecting and I'm using it as a way to manipulate. Now, if, you, if you've done that before, God bless you, okay? I, you know, you can hide it on Instagram, but I'm just saying, like, I'll give you some other examples. There's some of us, right? We, we, we post about social justice, but we never do any justice. I mean, people, like, your friends are smarter than that. Like, it's starting to get trite. Post about it, but you never do anything with it. Or you write Facebook posts complaining about the church and God's people, but you never serve and stay in a place long enough to fix the problem or make a difference. Now, sometimes you got to go. I'm not saying that. You lecture about the poor and the marginalized, but you never give any money to assist in the effort. Or you never serve with your hands, and that's free. You tell others to be accountable but you refuse to be sharpened yourself because you're just trying to avoid it. It's self-deception. And here's the thing, an indicator of the enemy at work in us is when we want the image of something spiritual without actually being remarkably spiritual. Here's the essence of spirituality. Here's the essence of our faith. Jesus, you gave it all. That is my model. I now give it all back to you. Do with me as you wish and the results are up to you. And many of us, we actually just, it's, it's, it's in an Ananias spirit. We don't really trust God with all of it. We, we say, God, you have it all and you can have it, can have it all. And our hands are lifted in worship and we're, yo, God, you can have it all. But he only has a portion of us. And, and it's your lip, you're stealing from yourself. And you're wondering, oh, I'm walking with God partially. Where's my peace? Well, you only have partial peace because God doesn't have all of you in all circumstances, good and bad. The spirit of self-deception is extraordinarily subtle. And to break it, we have to face it. Let's say that together, okay? The, the, the spirit of self-deception, it's extraordinarily subtle, but to break it, you have to face it. Come write that in the chat. To break it, I have to face it. And, and, and that's exactly what we're gonna do, okay? Look inward. How do we do that? We gotta look inward and pray upward. We, upward. We've gotta, pur God, purify my heart. Holy Spirit, others, identify areas, immerse myself in scripture, constantly check our motives, that, that might require us to move a little bit slower in life. What are my motives? But did you know that even though we might move a little bit slower in life, God can expedite anything at any speed he wishes. Okay. So here's what happens next. You, you with me so far? If you are, say yes. Okay. So, so Peter, he says to Ananias, okay, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and secretly keep back for yourself some of the proceeds from the sale of the land? As long as it remained unsold, did it not remain your own to do with it as you pleased? And after it was sold, pay attention, was the money not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this act of hypocrisy and deceit in your heart? You have not simply lied to people, but to God. Now, now it's really important for you to understand here that God gave Peter a word of knowledge. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. And we as believers, full of God's spirit, we actually can be used in that way. I'm just telling you, you can't parent without a word of knowledge. Because your kids running around doing all kinds of stuff, God could actually tell you where they were without them telling you where they were. 
I'm relying on the Holy Spirit to parent more than I'm relying on books. I read books, but the Holy Spirit is the book. And I need the Spirit of God at work in me. And what I'm saying is, is and, and we need other believers and other people in our life who, who utilize the gifts of the Spirit to tell us, hey, you might be out of line. I want to guard you before it's too late. So Peter's, he, Peter's using this word of knowledge, and he goes, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? See, how do we know this? Okay, Peter freely acknowledged that the land and its value belonged to Ananias alone. He was completely free to do with it as he wanted. God is not going to make you do things. He's going to give you an opportunity to be blessed when you're obedient to him. His crime was not in withholding the money, but it was in deceptively implying that he gave it all. This is the root right here. Ananias was insecure. He had a pride problem. What they wanted, him and Sapphira, what they wanted was, is they wanted everyone to look at them the way they looked at Barnabas. Barnabas sold the land. He brought it in. He laid it at the disciples' feet. They gave him, they nicknamed him encourager, right? And Barnabas, all of a sudden, he is this celebrated individual. And so Ananias and Sapphira, they see this and they're going, I want what he has. Their intention was not to offer God and God's people an offering. Their intention was that they would be lifted up and glorified. But the kingdom of God is opposite. If you want to be lifted up, you've got to humble yourself and if you are prideful and arrogant and seek your own motives, you end up getting humbled. Do you see the opposite nature of the kingdom? God will advance you at his speed, not your speed. When we run ahead of God, we end up getting ourselves in trouble. It's deception. God, my way is better. I need a portion of this. They didn't even have to give the money, but they said that they were going to give it all. And then they lied and problems came. See, the enemy will deceive and distract us into believing that we don't have an issue or the issue at hand is just one thing. However, there's usually a deep root that needs to be dug up and exposed. It happens in marriage all the time where it's like, okay, this is the issue and it keeps happening, but there's actually a deeper issue at play that nobody wants to deal with, right? Right? And so somebody is like, okay, they're mad because I have friends. I'm not using this as my personal example. This is a general example. And so somebody's mad or you have friends and then they're freaking out and then that turns them into cheating or doing something else or whatever it is. But really the root of that situation is, is they feel like they're going to be abandoned because they were abandoned when they were younger. Or somebody hurt them. And so, so, so what happens is, is when we don't deal with the root, we blame other people for things that they just need to do. And then we go and do other sinful things because we feel like we've been given permission, but we've actually never just gotten to the roots. I'm preaching to anybody today. If you haven't shared this on Facebook, somebody needs to hear this. Okay, instead of like take a praise break or shout, it's like take a Facebook share break. Amen, you know. Here's the thing, his sin was greed in keeping the money, but his greater sin was pride in wanting everyone to consider him so spiritual that he gave it all. When he had not, this was the root. And so here's, here's what happens. When we dig up the roots of our self-deception, it leads to a compound of issues we see with Ananias. So when we really get to the surface, here's what's going on. Ananias has a contempt for God. He's sacrilegious and is cheating, right? He's perverse vanity and ambition, a lack of faith, hypocrisy, shame. All these things sprout. It becomes this overflow of problems. But what was the root? It was pride. And really, what, what is pride for many of us? It's just insecurity. It's just us feeling like we're not valued the way we need to be valued. It's us feeling like we don't have what we should have. It's us looking around at other people going, why are they 30 years old and they got a mansion and a nice car and I'm barely out of my parents' house? Well, we've got to look inwardly and go, okay, oh, there might be some reasons contributing to why I'm still in mom's house. Or there are circumstances that I need help getting to work with other people to overcome. Some of it's self-induced, some of it's circumstantial. Whatever it is, here we are. Pride still comes in and steals. Pride still comes in and lies. No, no doubt there are inequities and there are challenges in our culture without question. But what do we do when we're in those situations? Do we stay and do we blame or do we say, okay, I'm recognizing these things. I need people to come alongside of me, which is why the church is so powerful. Which is why we need one another. Instead of isolating, 
and saying, I, no, 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 I got this, when you don't even know how to got this. And that's okay. There's some people that went before us who got it, and they can show us. I wanted to do a whole thing about you got this, and then you got God, and then you get God, and all this kind of stuff, but then I'm like, the kids are going to hate me. I'm going to do everything for the kids, you know, for the culture. So anyway, um, you know, it's like, it's like another example of this is like some of us, we try to live way outside of our means. And it's like, it's like, okay, you got student loans. Stop living like you're debt free and start understanding and recognizing I got some debt in my life. I need to address this. And if I deal with the short-term pain now, I can experience long-term gain later. You don't have to have what everybody else has. You don't have to do what everybody else does. You can have a whole lot of fun at your dinner table making grilled cheese and having a real life conversation. It ain't that good. Even if Instagram says so, what's good is peace. Because I got a lot, there's a lot of people running around all over the world taking selfies, posting scriptures. And they're in like Buenos Aires. And like, how did you even get there in a pandemic? It's like, you're at the moon? How did you get there? Like, it's like, what? And like, they got no peace. And I'm not saying freedom to do whatever isn't peace because it is, but it's just like, stop comparing your life because here's what got Ananias where it got him. It's blind spots. I was asking my staff, do, do I have some blind spots in my life? And of course, there was like only one, you know. <laughs> Why are you? Somebody get this man off the front row. It's mockery, you know. Uh, what, what's one of the blind spots? So <laughs> uh, they said, you chew gum so loud. And I'm like, that made me want to chew my gum even louder, you know. I'm like, I'm going to blow the biggest bubbles. <laughs> God, rid me of this rebellious spirit, you know? Another one is, is, is uh, this was the only other one, uh, is, is, is I interrupt sometimes. Because I'm like, okay, I have this thought. I got to get it out. I know you're talking. I know you're pouring out your heart. I know you're crying right now and like the world's ending, but like I have this idea. Anybody else like that? It's like your emotional intelligence just... It's like, I have an idea, and then all cooth and all consciousness just goes, and I'm like, you know, whatever. Like, anyway, and so I, I just, those are blind spots. And to be self-deceived would be to not listen to those blind spots. And here's how you know that you're getting good advice. Because here's the thing. Christian relationships, got to get in the block group. They launch sometime in September. By the way, September is going to be amazing. And so, Christian relationships are often like the mirror in your car. You know how the mirror says objects are closer than they appear? That's what Christian relationships are. True depth Christian relationships. Because they're actually closer than you think. And some of us are mad about circumstances we've got ourselves into. And we've got other brothers and sisters saying, hey... Hey, I'm worried about you. Hey, come back. Hey, I love you. Hey, I don't know if this is a good decision. And it's actually, you, you think they're distant because you're mad. But that's the voice of God closer than you realize. And so if somebody starts speaking life into you, don't turn it off right away. Don't shut it down right away. Don't, don't end it right away. Go back and say, does this make me better? Does this improve my opportunities? Does this make me a better employee, a better entrepreneur, a better boss? Does this make me a better Christian? Because sometimes after the moment where we hear the painful thing, because sometimes conviction, it cuts us a little bit, like a little, ooh, ah, ee, ah. But then when we step back and the surgery's over, we recognize, dang, they might be right. And if we do nothing with that advice, then it's foolishness. But people want to see you grow. And it's self-deception for us to think that we have it all together and never listen to any feedback. Not harsh feedback, not death feedback, not stuff that pushes us down, but stuff that actually leads us to better life. Are you following me so far? We got to break that spirit of self-deception. The only way is if we face it. So verse, verse five, it says, and hearing these words... Ananias fell down suddenly and died. Wait, hold on. 
Hearing these words, Ananias died. It'd almost be like if the Keeners were up here earlier and like, uh, and like, hey, did God tell you to leave? Go back to Lancaster, you know? And they're like, yeah. And then he didn't, and they're dead. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, Abby, please play. And um, Pastor Derek, would you wrap these guys up for me and just take them on out? That's what they get. That's what you get for leaving the block church. You know. <laughs> God definitely told them to, to go back. But like, like they're, they're in this moment, right? Look, look at it. And Ananias falls on Sunday, and great fear and awe gripped the, those who heard it. I guess so. And the young men in the congregation got up and wrapped up the body and carried it out and buried it. Just like that. Does that seem a little harsh? Let me give you a little context. The physical means for the death of Ananias, it was probably a heart attack or something, okay? Or shock or terror. But listen, listen, listen. Peter did not pronounce a death sentence on Ananias. He simply confronted him with his sin and Ananias fell down dead. It is not in the business of the church or the church leaders to pronounce a death sentence on someone. That's God's business. Let's be clear about that. So it's not the people of God's business to cast judgment and declare death or hurt over them. God will deal with people and his outcomes as he sees fit as the scriptures show us. It's just our job to lead people to all truth. But, but, but furthermore, let, let me give you some context here, okay? Uh, this was a critical juncture for the early church and such impurity, sin, infiltration could have corrupted the entire church. This is the beginning of the church. It is a pivotal moment. Does 2020 seem like a pivotal moment to anybody? So why does God remove them from the equation? This is important, okay? And I love what Morgan says. This is a, a, a writer. He says, the church has never been harmed or hindered by opposition from without. It has been perpetually harmed and hindered by perils from within. So, so, so God removes it. He says, I am not going to let this defile my church because this cancer will spread. I am looking to develop a pure, spotless lamb. Now, what I'm saying is we have the grace of Jesus and where there's sin, there's grace and God will cover your sin and all this kind of stuff. But what God is showing us is if we're self-deceived, how do we ever get to a place of repentance? And I just, can I be honest with you online, whoever you are, whatever church you're a part of, to our church, I just feel like the Holy Spirit dropped three things in my heart that the enemy is trying to do right now. And if you don't believe in the devil, you have not been paying attention in the year of our Lord 2020. And I think, I think the enemy's doing three things. Please pay attention to this. Here's the first thing I think the enemy's doing. He is desperately trying to divide us. Division. He's trying to divide the church. I mean, you name it. You turn on the TV. Don't do this. Do that. Oh, if they vote differently than you, then you could never share a meal with this person. Don't go here. Don't go there. You shouldn't support this. You should post this. You should do this. You should do that. All of this stuff that, is, that the enemy is using to divide us when sometimes stuff is simple. People are humans. People need love. People need support. We don't really have to overthink it. Who cares what somebody thinks or says about you? Stop getting in your head and getting in your feelings and stop being divided. People are not going to be perfect. They are going to make mistakes. They're not going to say the right thing or do the right thing all the time. Fight for what God's called you to, and that's to be unified. And if we're going to practice unity as a church, then we're going to have a conglomerate of opinions, of ideas. We're going to have a ton of stuff, and we've got to stop compartmentalizing people. That, that's what politicians do. We gotta start unifying together. That's the church. The enemy's trying to divide us. Here's the next thing he's trying to do. He's trying to distract us. Distract us. And because we get divided, then we easily get distracted. So we stop doing our rhythms, our spiritual rhythms. We stop attending church, stop watching church online. We stop our practices of serving, of giving, of checking in on people, of praying, of calling, of reading the scripture, right? We're divided and then we're mad and then we're hurt and we're all these different things. We're worried and afraid and, and then we're just distracted and then we get into bad relationships and we start having sex with people we never thought that we would even look at and we start doing all this kind of stuff and we, we make these decisions, these ideas. It's like, what is going on? We're distracted. 
And the enemy wants us distracted because a distracted church is an ineffective church. But a unified church that is undivided, see a house undivided can fight, can take position, can plant its feet and say, enemy, you can't steal from us. We've got to stop being distracted in this season. Pay attention. Don't be deceived. Do not be deceived. The enemy is trying to deceive us. Here's the third thing. I think there is a spirit of deviance at play. Well, what is deviance? Oh, well, it's, it's the fact or state of departing from usual or accepted standards, especially in social or sexual behavior. And the enemy is using this moment to slip in ideas and ideologies that are totally and completely anti-Christ. Let me just make a, a crazy statement, okay? This is so crazy. I know you won't even believe this, but do you believe that the idea even of pedophilia is starting to be accepted by pockets of people? What? W-T-F. Worship the Father, okay? You thought I, you thought. <laughs> That's what you call a dad joke to the highest form. I had to give you a little comic relief. I mean, can you believe this? And it's deviance. It's this idea of accepting these norms that are not normal. Do not be deceived in this season. How do we not be deceived? It starts by getting in our word, by reciting and hiding it in our hearts that I might not sin. Reminding myself I'm the righteousness of Christ, that Christ in me is the hope of glory. It's reminding myself that I was called to a higher standard of holiness. And here's the thing. Sadly, for many Christians in compromise, their greatest fear is not in sinning itself, but in being found out about the sin. we got to break that spirit. And if we're going to break that spirit, we have to face it. The problem, the problem with Ananias and Sapphira is, is not even that they sinned. It was that they were deceived and refused to acknowledge their sin. God gave them chances. And there's a point in some of our lives where we keep deceiving ourselves and keep not acknowledging the things in us that are displeasing to God. And then at some point, it's just like, man, I don't know. You've been mad for so long. Your heart is so hard for so long. It's like, is God even going to get a hold of you anymore? We got to be careful what we say because out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And when we start to feel certain things coming out of our mouth or into our thumbs, we got to check ourselves because there's a sifting happening in this season. Come on, stay with me. Look what Matthew 25 says. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. I, I do not want to be distracted and end up down a path that I don't belong. I belong to you and you, church, belong to me. And we together belong to him. That's the bottom line. And look at me. Last thing I'm going to say before you clap again. Last thing. Listen, this, this, this. Our only hope is Jesus. No one is coming to save us. <laughs> no one is coming to save us. I'm the best thing you got by the word of God right through my mouth today, okay? I'm just kidding. For all of you who took me literally, Pastor Grace, she's already canceling me. Okay. No. Our only hope is Jesus. And I'm not saying, do we not fight? Do we not advocate? Look, yeah, we, we've got to pursue the heart of God. I'm not saying that. Oh my goodness, yes. But like at the end of the day, all the things that we think are going to satisfy us and fill us, the people that we think are going to take care of us, our only hope is Jesus. People will disappoint leaders will miss it. I've got to get my eyes on Jesus because when I'm not, I get disunified. I get distracted. I get deviant. Oh. Let's skip ahead. Let's close. Let's, 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 let's finish. Verse 7. Here's what happens. 
Now, after an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, he gives her a chance. Man, God's grace and his mercy is so big. Do you understand that this is a moment? God's, God's going, hey, are you self-deceived right now? And he goes, tell me whether you sold your land for so much. And she said immediately, yes, for so much. See, sometimes when you get caught up in a lie and you speak it and you say it for so long, you start to believe it. It's why it's dangerous to not be in the word. It's why it's dangerous when we're not paying attention to the people of God, to the things of God. It's why if our culture is our God and if those people are our idols and we watch more of that than watch the word, if we pay more attention to the news than the good news, you understand more of that, then we start to believe lies and we can't decipher what truth is. It just automatically, it's ingrained in her. Then Peter goes, how? Could you two have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and, and I'm sorry, they're carrying you out too. And at once she fell at his feet and died, and the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear and awe gripped the whole church who had heard about these things. I know it seems harsh. I know it seems harsh. Marcus, come play. Come help me. I know it seems harsh, but stay with me. These guys had chance after chance, and, and God is so serious. Please. And I'm proud of you for watching church and being in church, but God is so serious, and he's using 2020 to sift stuff out. No more games, people. God is not playing around. I'm going to guard and protect my church because my message via the church is actually the hope of the world. And so I got to do whatever it does. And so what I pray sometimes is like, God, I want everybody to be here and love you and serve and attend and connect and give and all these different things. But like, even if somebody is causing trouble and they're like our greatest giver in the world, okay, I don't like, I just, I want you, if they're not going to be convicted and if you're not going to transform them, I'll be as patient as long as you want me to. But if they are spreading a cancer through the sheep, get them out of here. Because there's no amount of money, there's no amount of stuff that can pay for hurting others. And so God is using this moment to sift stuff out. He said, who's all in? And if you're self-deceived, I believe the Holy Spirit is with you right now and he's coming. And listen to this, Ananias and Sapphira. Sapphira's name means beautiful. And in Ananias' name, it means God's wonderful mercy. What? Think about it. There's a couple things happening here. God's beautiful, wonderful mercy removed these individuals from the equation because what the church was about to face was going to be even harder than they could even imagine. They were going to be pulled out of synagogues and places and they were going to be killed for their faith. They were going to be poorer than dirt and God was going to provide. They were going to be raised up to influence and leadership. They were going to be given mics and mouthpieces they never dreamed. God was about to get ready to explode and advance the church all over the world and so he had to sift out what didn't belong that was his wonderful marvelous beautiful mercy and secondly God's wonderful marvelous beautiful mercy is for you and I that the right time to do the right thing is right now because we have the scriptures that are saying to us pay attention pay attention to yourself pay attention to the world i love you and i'm showing you this story i'm offering you beautiful wonderful marvelous grace receive it today receive mercy today receive love today receive goodness today receive favor today receive all i have for you today don't waste it don't waste it I'm wasted. I'm showing you this story. I'm sifting out. I'm separating the goats from the sheep. Who are you following? 
Are you following a celebrity? Are you following an idea? Are you following a movement? Are you following this or that? Are you following what anyone tells you? Are you following the Savior, the only one who can save and heal and deliver and free and redeem? Our only hope is Jesus. And Jesus loves us so much that he sends us the Holy Spirit. John 16, 13. I'm closing with this. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you. Somebody say me. Somebody type in the chat. He will guide me into all truth so that I can be smarter than the lies they're telling me 24-7. You're smarter than that. Look at me. Hear me. Look at me. Hear me. Do your research. Study. I'm not saying don't. Follow up. Read stories. Educate yourself. But you are smarter because you have the spirit. You can decipher. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. Now, we may not know. We may not know what 2021 brings or when the virus will end. We may not know all of these different things, but I'm telling you, God can give you a peek around the corner. And guess what? I do know the future. Guess what? I do know the future. Guess what? You do know the future. That push come to shove, no matter what happens to me, whether well-fed, well-fed, clothed, hungry, or naked, I can be content. I've got a future. I've got a God who's prepared a place for me. He's prepared a table for me, even in front of my enemies. I, I've got an eternity. I've got a home. I've got heaven. I've got you. I've got a community. I've got unity. I've got... Jesus, so I know that my future is secure. I said, I've got heaven. So you can take my body and you can take my life, but you cannot take my soul because I refuse to be distracted and disunified because guess what? The media and other places tell me to be mad at you and you be mad at me. But guess what? We're going to be sitting at this long table together in eternity. And I'm going to be like, hey, pass the bread. And the carbs aren't going to matter. So oh, I feel like praying in the Holy Ghost over that one. I better work out my stuff with you now. Because I don't want to have to look at you in the eyes in heaven. Because I'm going to keep asking for the mashed potatoes. And like, I better just be able to look at you in the eyes now and tell you I love you now. That's why I started the sermon the way I did to our black community. I love you. And I know that there's a lot of grief and to everybody experiencing stuff. I love you. I don't want, I don't want anything between us. I don't get it all. But you're a human and so am I. I love you. And I love you, church. And I love you, kingdom of God. And I love you, world, who doesn't know that you're loved. And I'm going to get out there and give you my hands and my feet. Because nothing else matters because my eternity is secure. I just can't be self-deceived. You feel me today? Come on, come on. I just, I would just look around. Wherever you are, just look around. Look around. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is here. Look around. Every tribe, every tongue. Together we can and we will. Our best is ahead. You believe that if you do say yes and amen. Come on, let's give God a praise. Come on, let's give God a shout and a praise today. Come on, you can do better than that at home. God, we give you praise. Look, if you're watching this today, every head bowed, every eye closed, you might be far from God. You don't have a relationship with God. There's sin in your life. You've never invited Jesus into your life. Maybe you've done religion. Maybe you went to church, but you never walked with Jesus. You've been self deceived. And if that's you and you're watching, if you're here in person, if you're in Pashyunk and you're Center City, whoever you are, wherever you are, Sunday breakfast, and you're far from God, now's the moment. The right time to do the right thing is right now. And so if that's you and you're far from God, you need a relationship with God. Every head bowed, every eye closed, needs your sin to be forgiven and begin a journey with God. Would you lift your hand right now? I want to pray for you. I see 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 you. People online, give me that hand emoji right now, wherever you are. Come on, lift it up, lift it up. We're going to say a prayer together, and it's not magic, okay? Those with your hands lifted, we're going to say a prayer. It's not magic. It's just the beginning of your journey, okay? 
When we pray this prayer, after we pray it, I want you to go outside and I want you to get a book that begins your journey. If you pray this prayer online, I want you to email us. We will send you this gift that helps you begin your journey. Can we pray this all together? Can we just say, Jesus, come into my heart, come into my life. I need you. Forgive me of my sin. I don't want to be self-deceived. Be my Lord. Be my leader. Change me. Lead me. All the days of my life, I'm yours and you are mine. In Jesus' name, come on, can we give God a praise today? Amen. God bless you. God bless you.